chapter 9. And I will be reading just a verse of scripture. That is verse 8. And the word of God says, Let thy garments be always white, and let thy head lack no ointment. By the grace of God today, I'll be speaking on the subject of an important condition for lasting service. This is a very important condition that I'll be highlighting for lasting, impactful, fruitful, fulfilling, satisfying service. Let us pray. Precious Father, we want to thank you for the way you gathered us together in your presence today. Thank you for the opportunity to mingle our voices in praise, in prayer, in worship, and in adoration to your name. Thank you for what you have in mind to communicate to your people. For which reason you gathered us from far and near. And thank you for the way you've anointed me for this session to speak concerning your heart and mind of that important condition for lasting impactful service. And I give you glory and praise because my tongue will be the pen of a radio writer. And you help me to be able to present these things in the way you reveal them to me. So that at the end of the day, the things people learn and receive and hear and see, they shall be doers. And not just here as only. Amen. We give you the glory, the praise, the worship, and the adoration. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 There is a particular word that Jesus used in the scriptures, especially in the book of John, to describe and define his activities while he was here among men. An important word. And that is the word walk, W-O-R-K. He used that word to describe and define his activity. You know, when you read Matthew 4, 23, you know he was preaching and teaching and healing. When you read Matthew 9, 35, he was preaching and teaching and healing. You know, he went to several places. When you read out, step at the age, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, with the Holy Ghost of the power who went about doing good, healing the oppression of the devil, good was with him. There was a word that Jesus used to describe this thing, everything that he was doing, and that was the word walk. And you see that word repeatedly used in the book of St. John. John chapter 4, verse 34, it says, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. He said in John 94, I must walk the walk of him that sent me while it is day. For the night cometh when no man can walk. When he was together with his apostles and looking at the man who was born blind, the apostles asked him, Who among the parents sinned? Is it this man of the parents? And he said, John 19, there is no one among not neither his parents nor this man have committed sin. For that the works of God may be made manifest. When he was praying to God, his father in John 17, 4, he said, I have finished the work which thou givest me to do. I have glorified thee upon the earth. So he kept using that word, work, work, work. You see, the word work is a word that I think everyone of us can relate to. Everyone is involved in work. I mean, even if you have a housewife or a mom at home, it's work, father in work, mother in work. So you use the terminology that you don't need any gigantic spiritual assistance to be able to understand the ramifications of it when you use the word work, work. When in his home country, in Mark chapter 6, verse 5, he could not do what you normally do. The Bible tells us that he could there, he was not able to walk because of their unbelief. He could not do mighty works there because of their unbelief. And then in John 5, 17, he said, My father walked and he that door, and I walk. And so when he was calling us to service, he used that same word. 
You find it in John 14, 12. The work that I do shall you do also. So that was the word that he used repeatedly, repeatedly. He didn't call it so those job breaking things we call it now this ministry. Mm. You know, he didn't use such words, okay. big words. Okay. He used a word that farmers can relate to, mm. fishermen can relate to, mm. ordinary persons can relate to. And that was the word walk, walk, walk. One thing you and I know about work is that work can be very demanding and work can be very challenging. And the nature of the work we are involved in, that is what you and I call ministry or serving, what you and I call leadership or pastoring or evangelism or whatever, the nature of our work is that it is challenging. The work that Jesus did, being divinity, cannot be challenging to those of us who are just human. You know, we are human. He was divinity and human combined. If we find the work challenging, I know that you and I will also find it challenging. Now, there are a few things that are challenging about the work of service. In whatever city or location you are involved in, there are certain things that are challenging about our work of service. Let me give you a few here. Um, we are challenging our work, for example, with the place where we are doing it. I mean, some of us are in cities that are not responding, cities where the heavenly have not been broken. And when you operate under that kind of atmosphere, that is the way in which, you know, it limits many things, and that is the way in which it makes your work challenging. I remember when I went to Somalia and Sudan, uh, one thing was that preaching can be tough in itself. Serving can be tough, but when I went there, <laughs> because of the kind of atmosphere there, I could do no mighty things. I mean, I found it difficult to speak for 30 minutes. Wow. In fact, in Sudan, you don't call it church, they call it family meeting. Mm. And when you go there, in those days, I don't know how it is now, I've never been back. <laughs> One hit is enough. <laughs> in those days, when you go for the, what they call family meeting, which is church service, they don't put on light. Mm. Because the government during that time was trying to identify those who are Christians mm. with the intention of eliminating them. Mm. So, no light. So, everybody comes there in top they do. And you live through, you live through a dark alley. And everybody goes into the night. So, at times, some people don't have half of their faces covered. So, some of us have challenges with the, with the place where we walk as people who are sad. Even in the Western world, there are some cities here. Even the United Kingdom, whose atmosphere is still choked, where things are still a little bit more difficult than other places. I've had the opportunity of coming to the UK since 1989, and I've been to some cities I can hardly sleep overnight. There is a lot of choking things in the atmosphere. It's like, I remember when I went to a town known as Wadi some years ago. I was told there is a witch coven there. And it, it was difficult for me, as it were to function in that place. So we have challenges with the work in terms of the place where we are doing it. Some of us, some of us have challenges with the people we are working with. You know, the people we are working with, they may not have social skills. Some people have challenges with the people you are working with. Some of us probably have challenges with the forms we need to operate by. I remember when I started out in ministry in Nigeria, in a small town known as Hillary, I mean, we had challenges with money. I remember one time, we needed 300 now to book a place where we wanted to have a meeting. And the whole fellowship prayed and fasted for two weeks, mm -hmm. believing God for 300 now. <laughs> I mean, that's a challenge. You know, challenge with forms. There are churches that are challenged with forms to be able to operate the way you want to operate. There are ministers who are challenged with forms. You have a body, you have a revelation, you have a calling. But you are challenged not just with the people you are working with, but with the funds you need to operate. Some of us will not challenges with the expectation of people that we are working for. Some of you expect you to be a baby to heal everybody. Some of, you, some of them expect you to feed them. Some of them even expect you to pay their rent. 
to pay their school fees. It may not be very common in this part of the world, but I know that that's one of the challenges those who are serving, ministers, leaders, can be faced with expectations of people that are functioning. For even Jesus had that challenge. The expectation of the people that he was ministering to was that he was a political messiah. They expected him to come and deliver them from the shackles of Rome, mm -hmm. not understanding the kind of person that he is. So of us have challenges with the system within which we operate. And some of us are probably have independent ministries, but some of us belong to systems. A group of churches, for example, Reba Chow International Churches, is a system. Mm -hmm. And I can assure you that not everybody working in that system uh, it's okay with everything we do. Yeah. How we do it, when we do it, with whom we do it. And I've been in various churches too, where they have told me, look, in a point I said, well, I wanted to do this, the system does not allow challenges with the system within which we are operating. Some of us in our work also have challenges with the venue we are working from. I remember I was in a church who mentioned today, I know that those people are here, or they will join us later. And when I was preaching, they wanted to sack us from the building. <laughs> they said we were supposed to have finished by 9.30, and it was quarter to 10. <laughs> and the caretaker wanted to go home. So the caretaker was trying to break through the door to come in, to carry the pulpit, or carry my Bible. I mean, if you operate under such pressure, the only way you don't have a building of your own, or you know, a facility that is yours, you have challenges as it were with the venue that you are working from. I mean, these are challenges with the work. Some of us, we have challenges with the time we are having to operate. I know a church in those days here in London, service was 3 p.m. in the afternoon on Sunday. I mean, people want to come to church and rest, uh, not to come to church by 3 p.m. in the afternoon. I mean, that would look like a walking baby because since they're not going to church from the morning, you see, some things have demands that they place on us. Some of us have challenges with the leader that we're working on that. Our leader feels insecure. Our leader is not giving, is not showing the next example. He's not inspiring us, he's not motivating us. He's not challenging us, he's not encouraging us. I remember talking to a man who, when I went to a church, he kept using this phrase. Some of you, some of you, most of you, most of you. And whenever he uses the word, some of you, most of you, he was saying something negative. And these people have to find man, the man who took me back to the hotel. He said, if not for God, I'm tired. <laughs> and I'm tired of this place. He said, this man always gives the impression that we are all wrong, that we do the wrong thing at all times, as if to say we enjoy it. So some of us have challenges at times with the leader that we work under. Some of us have challenges with the language that is spoken in the community where we operate. Every community has its own language. Uh, I remember I went, to, I went to Spain about two, three years ago. I've been there before. But I went back about two, three years ago, and the pastor told me that they had to wait for the people to come. Ah! Wait for the people to come. I said, why that? He said, ah! Yeah, if you don't wait for them, they, 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 they don't be happy to come in the middle of the service. So you have to wait. <laughs> and uh, in that church, they have to interpret it for three or four. I mean, that's it. That, that's we as you have. Something that should be 20 minutes will now be like 60 minutes. So all of these things have a way in which they affect us. All of these things are demanding. So of us are challenged with how to bring people in, retain them, and get them interested in ministry. How do I bring people in and retain them? One pastor came to me and said, sir, the business was told this year. There are 1,232 people. He said, but our church is still lower than 150. He said, I have a problem. I, I, we don't retain. We would like to retain. You see, all of these things 
take their toll upon us. Now, why am I saying all of this so I can understand where I'm coming from? The point is, with all of these pressures that come upon us, that may not abate with time, one area where many people are serving, leading, or who are ministering, have an issue is with being able to remain fresh. With being able to remain fresh. That is an area where most Christians who are serving have a challenge. They need to be able to remain fresh. It's important for us to remain fresh if our work will be impactful as it should be. But this is an area where many people are facing all forms of challenge with being able to remain free because of the pressure, because of the stress, because of the challenge we have on the job, with our job, with the people, with the venue, with the community. The challenge is how can I remain fresh? Let me give you seven areas in which I believe that every Christian worker needs to be fresh in. But before I do that, let me first of all define what it means to be fresh. What does it mean to be fresh? It means to retain an original property, or to retain our original properties with which you started. It means not to change by time. What does it mean to be fresh? It means that our original qualities remain unimpaired. It means to be full of or renewed in vigor. It means not to be stale, not to be sour, not to be to become decadent. So we need freshness. Uh, but how can we be remain fresh on all these conditions and all these prayers? I have been in ministry now for like 37 years, I'll say. And one of the greatest things that I strive for, and concerning which I believe every Christian worker must go for, is ability to remain fresh in this work. Because there will be stress, there will be pull, there will be push, there will be all kinds of issues. Some of us have issues with the building we use. I've known churches that have lost their building. I've known ministers who have lost their houses. Now all those things take their toll on us. But I wanted to speak today about this condition of remaining fresh. How can I make it possible? How can I remain fresh? How can I keep the good wine until later? How can I be consistent in the midst of all of this? How can I have an enlarged capacity to take the pressure and the stress? I mean, some people have the challenge of being able to balance ministry and family. Some people's ministry have taken away their family. Some people's family have taken away their ministry. So all these things are very important things in the midst of all the demands on us, all the pressures on us. Now we're not slack. How can I remain fresh? In what way? What can I do? Now, there are some areas where I believe that a minister, a leader, or even a Christian will continue to be fresh. And I'm going to give you seven of them. We need freshness in all of these seven areas. Number one, we need freshness in our personal devotion. It is not just enough to prepare to serve momentarily. It is important to have a devotional life that is fresh. Our family health, our prayer life, our study life. The Christian growth is necessary for a better service. If you are not fresh in your devotional life, if you can't keep that freshness of when you just got born again in your devotional life, it will have an impairing effect on the kind of ministry that you produce, on the kind of service that you render. So we need freshness in our devotion. In the last day, the Bible says in Matthew 24, 12, because iniquity will abound, the love of many was called. You know, I've always asked ministers whenever I meet them, how is your pastor devotional life? I mean, it's something different to prepare to preach. It's another thing for you to have fuel in your tank. Mm. The trailer that takes fuel to the station 
where your fuel is discharged, and people can come and use it, must have quality fuel in its own tank. There are people running on empty. They are feeding on that, but they themselves are hungry in their soul. How fresh are you in your devotional life? Number two, every other we need freshness. We need freshness in our feelings. How do you feel? Your feeling is part of who you are. And whether we know it or not, our feelings have a way in which they impact us. There was a time that Elijah felt high and dry. He said, I'm alone. Do you know you can lead a group of people and still feel you're alone? Mm-hmm. You can be in the midst of a hundred people and never still feel that you are company. We need to be fresh in our feelings. You know, we need to be fresh in our feelings. I remember so many years ago I read the book of 2 Samuel chapter 3, verse 29. And David said something that touched me. He said that he felt weak, though he was anointed. I mean, he's someone who was anointed, but he feels weak. He said, I feel weak. No, I'm anointed. Now, that's a feeling. You need to be fresh. That bubbly feeling must be there. Mm. I've come across people who their feeling is like a desica. If they're going to come, let them come. If they're going to stay, let them stay. Mm. I don't care. Mm. Now, mm. <laughs> if the pastor is going to like it, let him like it. If he doesn't like it, let him not like it. Man, that is the feeling that some people are some have. But you know that is not the right feeling. You need to be fresh in the way you feel. Your, your, the way you feel must connote a connection to God and a satisfaction with what you are doing. We need freshness in our utterances, in the way we speak. Colossians 4 says, Let your speech be with grace, seasoned with salt. Ephesians 4 29 warns us about not the right field communication. To proceed out of our mouth, we should be careful what we say. Proverbs 6 2, you are snared by the words of your mouth. Proverbs 21 23, he that keepeth his mouth and his tongue, keepeth his soul from throne. Proverbs 13 3, he that keepeth his mouth, keepeth his life. So we need to be fresh in our thoughts. Our tongue must be the pen of a ready writer. We must never be fresh in what we say, harsh words. We need to be very careful with harsh words. We need to dip our tongue in the ink of God's word and speak with a soft tongue that breaks the bones. We need to be fresh in our utterances. And when you are going to preach or teach or lead, whatever you are going to do, you must communicate with the voice of heaven. When people hear you, they should be able to hear God through what you are saying. Your voice must be penetrating. Your voice must be effective. Your voice must cut. On the day of Pentecost, when Peter spoke, the Bible said they were caught at two and seven. They were caught to the heart. When Stephen spoke in at seven, the people were pretty in their heart. We need to be fresh now for us. Bring in a fresh word. Bring in a fresh, impactful statement. You know, have freshness in our classes. Number four, we also need to be fresh as it were in our looks, you need to look fresh. You know, I see some pastors and I say, you are pastoring 200 people. All your hair is gray. If you ask that what will you do? You will just be killed. You, you know, you just die. Fresh in your looks. I mean, people should look at you and say, you don't look your age. You are serving. God does not, and has not called us to serve in vain. He has not called, he has not called us to wear us out. Not the apple that very, but even one man is with you. You know, and we all with open praises behold as man the glory of God. We are changed from glory to glory. So we need to be fresh in our looks. You know, that is one thing that I think I, I have made effort to do. You need to eat the right food. You need to take the right vitamins. You know, when I looked at somebody recently, I said, hey, how old are you? When they called me, I said, wow! Because I thought it was a snow rat, my snow rat, my snow rat, my snow rat. I mean, not if it wasn't fresh in his looks. Your look is part of it. Mm. Your stand is part of it. Mm. I mean, I, I know that I'm not there yet. I still have areas I need to work on. Because this pot mm. will be taken to six parts. Amen. I'm never too late to start. Really? But we need freshness of look. As a protocol of this side, you need to be fresh in your look. 
as an ocean, they will refresh your roots. But if people look at you, they will not imagine that all the problems of the world are on your head. <laughs> I've been in some place that the protocol of it are, he was wrong with the front, two hours. I said, oh, nothing. <laughs> oh, nothing. God is the head of our countenance. Mm. Psalm 42, verse 5, Psalm 42, verse 10, Psalm 43, verse 5. So we need to be fresh in your look, the clothes you wear. I went to a church recently and all the, all the what do you call it, uh, the choir robes were all squeezed together. This was in Texas. I mean, this, this is a church I mean, I mean it's, a, it's a major church. The guy is a coordinator, has a beautiful building. But the choir robes were all rammed through. And I said, what is this? You're serving God like this? How do you come? Their own clothes were well pressed and ironed. The lipsticks were in place. Even the shoe were well, like when it comes to uh, the robes, they were not well ironed. You need to be fresh. Let your garment be, garments be always white. Let not your head lack on to it. It is not fresh anointing. From visible in the way you saw. We also need to be fresh in our thoughts, the way you think. Proverbs 23, verse 7, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. We must not have the need, our thoughts must line up with the word of God. Philippians 4, 8 tells us how to think. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 21, tells us that the thought of man, the thought of the wise, is foolishness. Psalm 24, verse 11 tells us the thought of man, a puff of wind. Our thoughts must be creative. We must be imaginative, we must be constructive with our thinking. We must think like God thinks. He has given us his word to help us to think such ways. Uh, the Bible says in Jeremiah 4, 14, we should, not, we should not have our vain thoughts in us, powerless thoughts, but thoughts that are powerful and impact, impacting. So we need to be fresh in our thoughts, we need to be fresh in our looks, we also, as it wanted to be fresh, in our relationships. Many people are interested in, in, in God's service, don't know how to relate. It's not just relating within your organization, it's not just relating to those below you. We're talking about learning how to relate to those above you. Learning how to reply texts on time. Learning how to reply emails. Learning how to respond to people in a positive way. Mm. We need to be fresh in our relationship. Mm. Whenever I get to a city where I know people on my contact, I give them a call or send them a text. I don't know. Mm. Some of them will not reply until I leave. <laughs> <laughs> and you're great, you're just in a Christian service. Now, the key to effectiveness at times is networking, not work. You will be better if you network with others. If you connect with us who have graces, in other areas where you don't have grace, you will be a better person. You will do much more than whatever you are doing. So we need to be fresh in our relationship with our spouses. I went to a church recently, a big church, a massive church. At least they should be about 14,000. And I discovered that the way the pastor was relating to the wife, what it had to do with the church service was not good enough. I had to, the one that came to me after the and complained. He said, nobody can speak to my husband and say, I'm mean, If this is the last time I'm going to come here. I said, if they will come when you will, will know that I've said the right thing. So when the man came with all the protocol officials, all the security guard with chest like barriers of, of timber and all of that, I looked at him and I said, I want to talk to you. And you and your wife, you know, I shut him down. And I said, two are better than one. I said, God gave you your wife to help you in your work, not just to help you at home, cooking and making your bed warm. I said, more than anything else, God gave me other a, a, a spouse because he saw that it was not good for me to be alone. He said, you are better than one because he had a better reward for their labor. I spoke to him, his eyes were, you know, like, <laughs> I was saying to myself, this is the last time I'm going to come here. It's fine, but I'm going to tell him the truth. At times, we need people who are going to tell us what we desire, not what we desire. Mm -hmm. People who call the spirit the spirit and, and not an agricultural implement. But we need freshness in our relationship. 
There are some relationships that are there that God wants you to be well connected to because of the kind of place He's taking you to. But you see, you have allowed those relationships to decay. You have allowed those relationships that are being renewed instead of being fresh. You know, you have allowed those relationships to tap out. And so, when you struggle in areas, you don't struggle. Because you have allowed those things, those relationships that start taking relationships, they'll fail and fall down. That's why the fact that God proposed them. God was the one who divinely connected you, like David, to Jonathan. If David had played with the connection to Jonathan, there was no way he would have been alive, even to fulfill what he has been anointed for. Jonathan was the key factor in preserving and protecting David and whatever the call he says he has received. We need the beauty and the excellence of freshness. We need to be fresh in our service. Our serving. You need to keep the good wine till the very end. It is he who I get to the end that shall be saved. Whatever we are doing, Ecclesiastes 9 says, do it all your mind. We need to be fresh in our service. We need to look for better new ways of doing good old things. We need to reinvent ourselves. We do not just need to be relevant to the old, we need to be relevant to the young. I went to the church, just like our church in the learning. The leadership were actually, the youngest was 58 years old. But the church was filled with young professionals, young adults. It was family who see the atmosphere was bubbling. So I said, I said to the pastor, what is the key? He said, we speak their language. So you can see the way I'm dressed, I'm dressed in one of them. Now that is freshness, not for you to. So what is coming in your legs is three suits. At times, t-shirts, casual. I mean, those are ways in which you can be fresh in yourself. Mm. Not to say, as it was at the beginning, so it did not so forevermore. <laughs> At times, you need to adapt. At times, you need to connect in a different way from the way you've been connecting. I've learned this from leading our church in the Lord. The average age of our members is 27. When we look at the average age, I mean, the people that we have who are above 60, probably they are just a, hand, a handful in terms of uh, when you compare to the figure of the church. So we need to be fresh in our service. You should stand in the way that we say, they will say, wow, you have never done this before. I mean, I've been in places where protocols who are telling to us say, wow, this is beyond comprehension. They are almost like, you know, protocols that are telling to the president of the U.S. This is my name, I'm reporting for duty, sir. So, wow. 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 <laughs> and at the last seven times, eight times, ten times, you will see that there is not lots of momentum. They are warm as they have always been. They are on point as they have always been. They have a hand on everything. There is nothing like, I'm looking for this, I'm looking for that. They always have a way of predicting what they are likely going to be. So we need freshness. I'm giving you how many now? Seven. 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 Okay, the remainder I will keep. So that when I write the book, you buy it. <laughs> now, generally speaking, as it was, we need freshness and love what Ecclesiastes 9 8 is talking about. Let your garments be always white. There's no way you can keep white without refreshing. Then let not your head lack onto it. There's no way your head will not lack onto it except you always look for. Area Quickly, I want to give you some reasons why you need to be fresh. If I now teach you eight very important principles of a fresh life of service. Why do we need to be fresh? Why do I need to be fresh? In my singing, in my preaching, my teaching, in my leading, in my service of what importance. Why do I need to be fresh? Number one, Freshness is beautiful, delightful, attractive, charming. Freshness is very pleasant, lovely. Freshness has a captivating nature. When a man's message is fresh, it captivates. When a leader leads the way they ought to lead, they are captivated. They draw people. They draw people. When you serve, in a department the way you want to serve. Members of the church gravitate 
and become members of the department. If you lack participation in terms of church members joining you in the department where you are serving, something is wrong. If you are fresh, and you are like a scribe that is instructed in the kingdom of God, bringing out things both old and new, it's beautiful. Freshness is beautiful. Whether it's in the church, or in a relationship, or in serving or leading, freshness. I mean, I've been to some churches, or gone to some meetings, and whatever I have an opportunity to go back the next time, I look forward to it. Because I will see new things. God is a God of newness. Newness has something to do with freshness. Number two, freshness is uh, is a symbol of God. God is fresh. Psalm 102, verse 27. He said that one was the same. Hebrews 13, 8. He said Jesus kept the same yesterday, the same today, the same forevermore. Ever new. Freshness is a divine attribute. Freshness is that indication of the presence of life. When there is freshness, in a church, it means the life of God is flowing. When there's freshness in your service or in your living, it means you are enjoying the power and the ability of God flowing richly through you. So freshness is a symbol of life. It's freshness is like no, it's it's a nature, it's a divine nature. Fresh. The steadfast love of the Lord never cease. His masses never come to an end. They are new every morning new every morning number three why do I need to be fresh you need to be fresh because it facilitates usefulness I mean anything that is fresh is what we use fresh clothes if I want a fresh towel I want a fresh fresh towel God wants you to be a fresh treasure instrument with teeth according to Isaiah 41 15 so freshness, as it were, um, it facilitates our usefulness. In first Psalm 17, when Paul, I mean David came to the battlefront, I mean he had just been freshly anointed. In first Psalm 16. So his glory was fresh in him. And then the job 2920. And his bow was renewed in his hand. But Saul had lost his anointing. You know, at that time he had disobeyed God. In first Samuel 13, he had disobeyed God. First Samuel 18. So the death flags have caused the ultimate of the apostle time in David's life not to be in the shape it's supposed to be. But David had a, David had a fresh anointing, though he was a shepherd boy. Mm. He didn't have the armor so, but he had the anointing. He had his catapult. And when the anointing in him followed that story, entered Goliath's head, as it was saying to a bullet. So when you are fresh, you put yourself in line for promotion. When you are fresh, you put your life and you put yourself in line for progress. When you remain fresh, God will make you his choice man. Just woman. You need to be fresh in your worship. And worship life needs to be fresh. Everything and all things. Because freshness facilitates usefulness. Number four. We also need to be fresh to keep what we have. If you are going to keep your congregation, you need to be fresh. Many pastors say, I don't know where they are living. Well, those people are going to look for greener pastors. Sheep always lie down when they get to greener pastors. He said, he made me to lie down. He made me to lie. One man said, he said, when people come here, you say, I'm going pastor, I'm going pastor. He said, something is wrong with that. I said, no, you are the one something is wrong with that. You are the one that is to be fresh. The Lord is my shepherd, I said, I don't want God always lead the sheep to pastures where they are going to be taken care of. Where they get fresh supply of the word and the spirit. So many times when you castigate or look down on other people or assume that they are the fault, to keep what you have, you need to refresh it. You have a position? Refresh. You have an anointing. Refresh. 
The servants cried out in Psalm 22. Verse 10 says, My horn shall I exalt like the horn of a unicorn and shall be anointed with fresh. I mean, you will discover freshness, have to keep what you have. Help you to keep your position. Where Saul lost his freshness, he lost his position. His bishopric, another person took. I always tell people, I tell people, Pastor Tim, God, you see, all the members are coming to your church. He said, Are you hearing that? I said, No. Without stewardship, we grow grasses. <laughs> and when sheep come here to feed, they lie down. Every place where sheep can find freshness, they will lie down. It's not a matter of you making them do what they don't want to do. It's a matter of what they will automatically do as it well, because their soul calls for freshness. So we need to be fresh to keep what we have. Paul was telling Timothy, say that good thing that is committed unto you. First Timothy 6 20 said, keep by the Holy Spirit. Number five, we need to be fresh. To attract God's attention. God is looking, his eyes are over there, his eyes are running to and fro through the whole to show himself strong on the behalf of those whose heart are perfect. He relates to the heart. When he found David, Psalm 19, verse 20 said, I found David, the son of Jesse, with my holy oil, have I anointed him. Freshness attracts. Freshness attracts not just to men, but also God. God, when you are fresh, God has a way in which he recognizes that. He said, David is the man after my heart. He was where? He was in the jungle, but he was fresh. He was there among the sheep, but he was fresh. Look at those wonderful songs he wrote when he was among the sheep. Not as somebody whose mind is fresh. That someone whose thoughts are fresh. Look at the kind of sounds that even spoke about Jesus coming, Jesus' death, Jesus' burial, Jesus' resurrection, Jesus' ascension. So we need to be fresh. It helps us to keep what we have. And that is what the principles that we share in the few minutes are important to help you keep your freshness. Let your garment be always white. More than anything else. I, I make effort to remain fresh in all those areas that I just told you. I make all the effort. I go to all the extent. I do everything I can to make sure that I'm fresh so that my words cut like a double edged sword. Number six, why we need to be fresh? So that we may be impactful. We may be impactful. And it's not this tent, it's even beyond the ground. Then you need to use more energy. But wisdom is profitable to that. What I see some like sense of people go when they are praying, I say to myself, is it this difficult to pray? Hey, ah, but, ah, what's going on? What's, what's the going on? You see why you are not in God in heaven? Why you come once, you shall be not. When you see people who are in God in heaven, I'm going to share that with you. You see the way they speak, authority speaks. Because they are, they are currently in conversation with God. I noticed something that happened once. I was in Bethany in Osa in Zimbabwe. And T. Ellis Bond was ministering. And there was this man who was raving mad. And you know, he does this, I don't know what he does now. But whenever T. Ellis Bond prayed for someone sick, blind, deaf, whatever, he will turn before he opens his eyes and begin to go. He's not ready to take your testimonies and have it recorded so that he can publish it in the magazine. No, that's what he does. He will just do the work, turn, and go. So if they, they brought this man in chains about eight people who are holding on to the man while he dangled and threw them off. I was watching. And they brought him to Zionist one. And he was still raving and foaming in the mouth. And I'll say, this is going to be tough. This is a demon in Africa. This is going to be tough. <laughs> this is not an American demon that speaks in international version in English. <laughs> he looked at him. See, you would not even believe he was talking to this man. Mm. He said, you foul spirit of insanity. I 
Jesus, remember the words I just said. Come out of me in the name of Jesus. He never said the name of just one. Because I was in the name of just one, then I'm just two. Then I'm just then I'm not fresh. Repetition, the demons are not there. That's right. God said, don't repeat. And he has a in glad. I hear it. So he came and he was going. And the demon possessed man ran out of him. Dragged it on the eight people with him. He didn't talk. He didn't talk. He was good. They were still following. He didn't talk. He was good. Then he turned back and said, I told you to leave him. The demons came out of the man. Threw him on the ground. And he walked on and said, Something, nothing has happened. Now that is freshness. My brother, that is freshness. You know, and that has like impacted me. In the way I saw that man. They were not together for long, three, just three days. And I saw that when you have what it takes, you don't repeat, they want Jesus one, they want Jesus two, they want Jesus that, come down, oh Lord, and manifest your papa, come down. <laughs> come down to where? <laughs> we need freshness to make him part. If they are not making the kind of it part, you should be making in that community, your battle axe is not sharp. Your weapons of war are outdated. You need to upgrade. There are some stuff. You see, there are some applications, even on your iPad or, or Samsung tablet, that you cannot use if you don't update. So you need to update. You need to update. You need to, you need to refresh. You need to get current. You need to get on the page where God is. We need to refresh. To make him mad. That's number six, is it? Yes. Number seven, we need to be fresh to last long and be relevant for a long time. There are some people we started ministry with who are no longer relevant. What happened? They lost their freshness. In those days, they will say, but what of now? What of now? Oh God, I help you in this past. I hold the years to come. What of now? I have been, at least in Nigeria, at the very top of ministry. And I know those people that we used to walk up and down and do a whole lot of things. But now, even when you sit at them, there's no freshness. A lot of storytelling. There's no depth anymore. Deep is not going to deep anymore. They are not current. At times I ask some of them, what is the Spirit saying? Because I want to know what God is saying. I want to confirm what God is saying to me. Say, what is the Spirit saying? Say, like what? <laughs> he doesn't even know who we are talking about. <laughs> what is saying you? you? You must be that kind of person. You are savvy. What is the Spirit saying? I like a friend of mine, a brother in uh, Texas. Whenever he calls me, say, what is the Spirit saying this month? Say, because I've been waiting on God and he says some things to me. And whenever we exchange like that, we are there for the five minutes talking about what the Spirit is saying, how relevant it is to the past, the importance of it for the future, and so on and so forth. So you are like need to be fresh, to last, and to stay relevant. There are some churches in this community here in London. In the 80s and early 90s, they were the continent of ministry. Now, where are they now? Mm. You and I are also According to Hebrews 4 1, it says, Let us fear. Lest the promise left for us of entry into his rest. Any of us will seem to come short of it. We can come short. There is nothing in who we are or what we are doing now that in a few years down the line, five, ten years, we may become an element. Mm. I've seen so many things come in ministry. I've seen so many people rise and fall. There was a time here in London when you say, I'm here. It's like a religion. Since the day of John Wesley, nobody has heard it who said for 100 days continuously, he did hear. And the attendance was full. But where is he now? He is back in his village in Oguashiku. He used to be in Botswana. He used to, some of the things you recorded here, including your faces, displayed it on their television there. After a while, he was not able to make ends meet anymore. And he had to relocate to his village. 
was that the end God had in mind? No. I thought what you are thought to do. I'm not of evil. To give you an end and an expectation. The path of the righteous, Proverbs 14, is a shining light. But you see, like Paul said, I keep my body under. I keep my body under. Less after I have preached the gospel. I myself should be cast away. We need to be fresh. It's very easy to lose your continence. It's very easy for your continent to fall into the water. Like that man said. It's very easy for you to be distracted. It's very easy for us to be overtaking the fault. It's very easy to grow weak if you don't build up strength. It's very easy to lose your fragrance, the anointing of your fragrance. What makes people come to you is not yours, it's divine. And you need to keep connected so that you can remain. Someone asked me, said, what is the greatest achievement in ministry? I said, I'm not going to talk about the continents I've gone to. I'm not going to talk about the crowd I have. I have spoken to. I said, one thing is my achievement. I've been able to keep the good wine until now. Mm-hmm. Being able to keep yourself fresh with all the pressure. Marital pressure, financial pressure, children of children, pressure of people, pressure of building, pressure of all kinds of pressure. I tell them, I do everything to make sure I remain fresh. I do everything, and I'm going to share a few things with you that will help you retain the good wine. In the next few minutes, I want to share with you principles that will help you maintain your freshness as a leader, as a minister, or and as a worker. Whether you're a leader, a minister, a worker, all of us are walking. Jesus called it walk. He said the thing that is the power of me, according to John 5.36, is the work the Father has given me to finish. And when he finished it in John 19.13, he said it is finished. Now, let me say this to you. When I started out in ministry, I started well. I had a good foundation. But you see, even if you don't have a good foundation, your building can still be striking with pillars. Mm. <coughs> After God told me to leave the church that I was leading, called Holy Ghost Corpus, He told me to leave in 1987, January. I called the elders of the church and the people that were leading, and I said to them, I have to leave. I said, because this church cannot help me in giving expression to the kind of body I have. God has given me a mandate and I want to answer to it. They said, ah, this God worked too. I said, yes. But the nature and type of God's assignment to each and every one of us differ. So I went back home, January 1987. I left 86, 86 December, but effectively January 87. And I sat at home and I was praying and I was waiting on God for direction. Isaiah 30, 21 said, I shall hear the voice behind you saying, this is the way. Now one of the options, walk in it. Isaiah 9, 8 said, God gave a word to Jacob, and it became the light within which Israel traveled. So one of them said, one of them, that word is a lamp to my feet, and a light to my path. I say, God, teach me how to do this. I want to know how ministry is done. No, I have never actually attended or been a member of any church charismatic. The, the 1986 experience in our local small church fellowship, known as Holy Ghost Corpus Fellowship, was my first experience. That is part of life. So I said, I wanted to teach me how to do ministry because I want to get it right. He said something to me that I can never forget. He said, people whom I call to do ministry, you only start by trying to gather crowd. He said, but look at the pattern that I use. You know the Bible says in John 13, 15, and I'll give you an example as I'm very good, so do you. Luke 6, 40 says, the disciple cannot be better than his master. He that shall be perfect shall be like 
like his master. First Peter 2 21, Christ has led for us an example that we should follow in his steps. So he said, Look at men doing ministry. And they are like that. He said, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is what I want you to read so that you can walk where I walk. You can hear what I said. You can hear, you can know those I spoke to. You can know how I spoke to them. So I looked at Matthew, Mark, and John, and I added the verses together. It was 89. 89 chapters. And someone occurred to me that if I read three chapters every day, I will read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John through once a month. So I started. I started with the three chapters every day. And I did that for 12 years. Wow. My foundation in ministry and my ability to teach and train and raise ministers was born through that instruction. He said, when I started ministry, what did I do? I said, you raised apostles. That was the first thing he did. He wanted to put in them. I said, he has been I mean, Matthew 4. Follow me, follow me, follow me. By the time you read Mark chapter 3, verse 14, he said he gathered these people together that they may be with him and that he may send them out. Your ability to send will be with, first of all, by the people you raise. So I started looking at the principles that I saw in Matthew, Matthew, and John. And I came up with eight principles. Eight principles that you need to operate by if you are going to remain fresh. If there was anybody who remained fresh from beginning to the end, it was Jesus Christ. Matthew 3 was at the beginning of his ministry. A voice came from heaven and said, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Two and a half years later, Matthew 17, 5, another voice came, This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased, hear ye him. He was also like a various kind of pressure, even political pressure. By the mother of James and John, they tried to leave him. They said, please, when you get into your kingdom, let my son, James, sit on your right hand, my other son. Those are pressures. I also had parents pressurize me even as I was raising up ministry beats. They would come, I remember one man, don't let me mention the name. He came to the place where I was teaching and training these young ones. He put his head through the He said, I bring God. Stop brainwashing these children. Stop brainwashing these children. I look at somebody. Everybody needs a brainwash. It depends on what you wash your brain with. <laughs> Is that someone who does not need a brainwash? Today, some years ago, he came to our conference, stood before the people and apologized. I didn't see what I saw there. He didn't understand what I was walking by then. But I was happy that I insisted on washing the brain <laughs> of his children. So in the next few minutes, I know there will not be enough time for us to go exhaustively into this, because blessing I did not keep the time. But they shall be invited back. <laughs> That's one of the principles you need to learn in life. If they invite you to a place that is here 10 minutes, keep to it, or that will be the last time you are there. Not even when it is here in harmony, there is no problem. <laughs> there are some principles that you need to operate by. Number one, know who you are. To remain fresh, you need to know who you are. Because if you don't know who you are, other people will want to mold you into what they think you are. Know who you are. Jesus said, I am, I am, I am, 18 times. In the book of John. He was saying, in other words, this is who I am. I'm not going to copy anybody. And I'm not going to compare myself with anybody. When the apostles tried to compare him, in Luke 9, you know, in Luke 9, verse 51 to 56, 
They were about to pass through a particular place. And the people resisted him. And the apostle said, Please God, Father, let us come fire from heaven as a light shall be. He said, no, I'm not going to do it like Elijah did. I know who I am. You see, you'll be able to remain fresh if you are who you are. Who you are is supported by the grace of God. Don't think that because you are unique, you are out of form. Be happy with your originality and your uniqueness. I remember when I started preaching, I would come and say, we have never seen anybody preach like this. Oh. Which one is your own? We have never seen anybody behave this way. Oh. Which one is your own? They never, they never. In fact, when I go to places now, people say, sir, you are different. You are a, you are a bread or fresh air, whatever they call it, that English idiom. So, know who you are. Stop comparing and stop copying others. Our destinies are different. If two of us are doing the same thing, one of them is not necessary. So God wants you to know who you are. There's nobody like you in the whole world. Naturally, humanly, and physically speaking. Even if you are twins, your DNA is absolutely unique to you. God does not make clothes. He makes original. So be yourself. If you are yourself, you will be fresh. A freshness will come when you are yourself. Don't be stereotyped. Now you are in London. Behave like this. Oh. <laughs> the gospel is one gospel. I know there are practical aspects of it. But be, know who you are. You see, when you know who you are, nobody can threaten you. You know who you are. Jesus says, I am. I'm God. You don't know. I'm God, though. I am the way, the truth, the life. I'm the living water. I'm the bread of life. I'm the good shepherd. I'm the open door. I am. So the big question I'm going to ask you is, who are you? Who are you? When you know who you are, then keep that originality, keep that freshness. Don't say let us do it the way they do it. So it can be the way it should be. That is not standing out. If you want to stand out, you have to do it in a way they have never done it. Everybody who has attracted attention has done things in the way it was never done. Their uniqueness was the key to their greatness. Your uniqueness. Your church doesn't have to be like another church. The stamp you have is the sign of quality. The standard of the religion of heaven was put at you and said, you are, like Paul would say, I am what I am by the grace of God. So number one, to remain, retain the fruitfulness of your, 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 your freshness, know who you are. Number two, know who you are trying to please. What am I trying to please? The church member? So part that be in the system? Please yourself? Please your wife? I was in a church. The pastor told me. He said, many of the things I take here is to please my wife. Mm. And I looked at her, he was gambling with those lives. Who is your wife? Paul said to the Thessalonian Christians, in first eleven chapter four verse one, he said, "We have taught you how you to how to walk and please God." Who did Jesus please? God. To so try to please people, you be trying to do what God cannot do, because not even God please people. Brother Eddie, who came to collect me from home, I told him, "I said, I don't understand the way this world is configured. The white people want to be black." Now they're walking around again. They want to only go down. And uh, black people want to be white. They are preaching. So where is satisfaction? Where is contentment? No, you have to please. I always 
say this to people that I settled this thing a long time ago. Who are going to please with the way I walk, with the things I do, with how I do them. And that's helping to be fresh. Because trying to please many people or interests, by the time you please these people, you will be able to please these people. And by the time you please these people, you will be able to please these people. So what I will do, I will do that I call vocation from learning to seek vocation. I am centered on pleasing God. And that has simplified my life. Who am I trying to please? With the way you sin. Who are you trying to please? The pastor? If you are trying to please the pastor, you don't know what it means to serve. The pastor can give you award, but only God can give you reward. Only God can give you reward. Psalm 58, verse 11, the Lord rewarded the righteous. 1 Corinthians 15, 58, be steadfast, unmovable, always abandoning the work of the Lord, doing things that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Hebrews 6, 10, be not stopped from a flood of those who pray their pictures, inherit the promises. There are promises to inherit from Satan. No who you are out to please. If we please God, it is the right thing to do. Not because it is the easiest thing to do. It's important for us to realize that. I'm always disappointing somebody. I always say to I'm always disappointed. One man came to me one day, he said, I'm disappointed. I said, yes, I'm always doing it. I'm always disappointing somebody. At one time or the other, I always say things and do things. In obedience to God, it is God's work, not your work. It has to be done according to what was revealed to you from heaven. God told Moses, if you are going to build me a habitation for the sanctuary, Exodus 25, 9, Exodus 25, 40, Exodus 26, 30, Exodus 27, 8, he said, make sure you build it according to what I showed you. Don't do it according to what you think is right. Don't do it according to the popular opinion. Make sure you do it according to the evidence I showed you about. We must build according to matter. Many pastors, time pastor churches, that are not built according to the pattern God gave you because you want to be like the Joseph's next door. We want to be like them. We want to do what they did. So that we can be the way they are. But God wants you to be unique and different. There is no provision for you to be the way they are. Know yourself and know you. Know yourself and know who you are out to please. And how to please God. Number three. Know what you are called to do. As an usher, know what you are called to do. Follow up director, know what you are going to do. Protocol, no. You see, not knowing is a problem. If you don't know what you are called to do, you will do things that are not what you are called to do. I remember some years ago, our church people said, We need to do crusade. And we spent money and we rented, you know, front lights and we went to a field and we put up everything. And I sat down there. Get ready to preach. And God said, Did I call you to do that? <laughs> I remember in those days, you know, I love to, you know, we'll do what we call the demonstration of the Spirit. Our service will start by 9 until 3. We are still moving the Holy Ghost. And God said, You enjoy this, don't you? I said, Yes. He said, If you continue doing this and you enjoy it, you will no longer be able to do what I call you to do. You will lose your freshness. You lose your cutting edge. Because you enjoy doing it. You don't know that I enjoy throwing people up upside down. <laughs> Throw out gas at them, kick them, touch them, sit down on chair. We're going to go back. I'm going to go back. The whole church is in matrimonial. I said, wait, you should be done. <laughs> but you see, I have to sharpen my cutting edge. Because that was not my environment. That's what makes me stand out. 
That work make, make, make me a reference point. I do power conferences, it's good. But God says, I have called thee. I have chosen thee. I have ordained and anointed thee to take my word to the nations. So I say, why don't you have a mega church in Lagos or Abuja? Take my word to the nations. That's what keeps you relevant. I could sit down and have a big church, but right in front of the church, we did it up. Because that's not what he called me to do. Somebody asked me, when are you going to retire? I said, the Bible says, the Bible says, in Revelation 14, 13, blessed are they that die in the Lord, for they will rest from their labors. I said, with the way I'm going, I think I will, I will down the field. <laughs> now, why? There is no vocabulary for retirement in the world. You keep going until you expire. So what am I saying? No what I'm called to do. No what I'm... You see, the point is, the era in which we are is the era where a particular expression of ministry is very popular. But that's not what God called you to do. Mm. Because if called someone else to do that, does not mean he has called me to do that. So no. What you are called to do. Thank you, man. Don't worry. We have arrived. We have adjusted it to one and a half hours. So you are giving me time. Zero minutes. Zero point five. Thank you. We have adjusted it. I'm just speaking for one and a half hours. Then you can go on and do other things. But I want to get this out to you. Are you getting anything from me? This is what we need. Freshness. Are you fresh in your mind? Are you fresh in your looks? Are you fresh? I, I saw I saw a woman recently who is so so far my junior. I said, Madam, you are growing old. Is this ministry? I said, that's not ministry. It's your mismanagement. I said, with 250 people, you are like this. If you have one thousand more, we are. We are going to be invited back for a funeral service. So know what you are called to do. Stay with it. Don't duplicate other people's call. Work with vision and not television. Television means to keep changing the channel. One minister in this community here, some years ago he said he was going to be a bishop. So he became a bishop. And then later he said, he's an apostle. He became an apostle. So when I saw him, I said, the only thing I've not become is a pope. <laughs> and the way we are going, very soon you will call us to come and celebrate. Because what is he saying? I don't understand. What's he up to? Because some of these things cannot be harmonized. So this things cannot even go hand in hand. God who separated them, know why he separated it. Know what you are called to do. Oh dear, so many things to see. But know what you are called to do. If you don't know what you are called to do, ask the following five questions. One, what am I gifted to do? Two, what do I love to do? What are my desires? Three, what abilities do I have? Four, what kind of person am I? Five, you want to write everything? Yes. Okay, let me go over it. What am I gifted to do? Two, what do you love to do? What do you have a heart for? Three, what abilities do you have? Four, what kind of person are you? Personality. Five, what experiences do you have? That is number three principle. Know what you are called to do. Then number four, focus on what matters most. Focus. Let me say this to you. To be that fresh, we should not allow ourselves to be distracted by trivialities. One thing I've come to know about the devil is that if he cannot get you to do wrong, he will get you to be busy with the wrong thing. He can't get you to do wrong. But even the thing you are doing, which you think is right, as far as God is concerned, is wrong. 
and you cannot get it to do wrong. It will get you to be busy with trivialities. It will keep you doing the good thing instead of doing the better thing that God has graced you for. One of the key to a successful life is focus. Paul says, this is one thing I do. I forget those things which are behind. I read for those things which are before. Philippians 3, 14. I impress towards the mark for the price of the high calling of God in Christ. Psalm 27, as Paul says, one thing about is that of the Lord, and now will I seek out. Jesus looked at Martha. He said, you are careful and troubled about many things. Only one thing is needful. Focus on what matters most. God told me as a young minister, he said, focus on what matters most, and I will make you the focus. When light is focused, it can cut through steel. Diffuse light have no effect. Ability of penetration. How can I remain fresh? Drop some things. Drop some. One of my sons came to me and said, Sir, I have uh, eight messages to preach every week. I don't know where to get it from. I told him, I said, What is most important? What focus on what matters most? What kind of a church did God give you a mandate to raise? When he told me what mattered most to him, to him and to their church, I said, focus on that. He called me after about six months, said, thank you for the advice. I can see the difference. Focus on what matters most. Many of us have enormous potentials. But the point is that we dissipate. You are still the one counting money, carrying money home. You are the one making the orders on the internet. You want to buy new life, and you have to you have go good for it. All those things are things that they're, 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 they're the business. That's why the apostles say that one point in time. We want to give ourselves continually to pray on the ministry of the world. Look for men who will we appoint. Over this matter. Look for men to coordinate, whom we may now appoint to coordinate this affair. Focus on what matters most. Jesus Christ was going to Jerusalem. In those gospel, chapter 9, remember the story? And some people were trying, his focus was Jerusalem. Psalm 25, verse 15. Say, my eyes are ever towards the Lord, and He will take my feet out of the net. There are some things that by now you should shed off. Allow other people to take care of it so that you can keep your cutting edge. Refuse to worry. And who locks the door? Who opens the door? I know the box stops on your table. But appoint faithful men. To such assignments, focus on what matters. We we'll give ourselves continually to prayer for the ministry of the world. Number five, how can I maintain my freshness? My freshness. Listen to this. Listen to God. Make a habit. I'm not saying make a habit of talking to God. No. Listen. The problem is not talking to God. The problem is listening. Many people don't have a problem with talking to God. Many people don't have a problem with talking What their problem is, listen. Isaiah 15 has come. The Lord has given me the tongue of the Lord. And I may speak a word and say to him that is ready. Morning after morning, he will let my ear to hear the Lord. There are two statements in the book of Revelation. To him that have a comment, to him that have a comment. The second one is, he that have an ear to hear. Let him hear what the Spirit is saying. Revelation 2, 11, Revelation 2, 17. Revelation 2, 
29, Ephesians 3, 6, 3, 13, 3, 22, is the hearing that we have a problem with. Listen to God. <coughs> Learning to listen to God is one of the keys to staying fresh. Depend on your capacity to hear God's voice. His eyes are over us, his ears are heart of prayers. Even when we don't say it, he knows it because he sees our mind. But that is not something you can do if you don't listen. I remember I this when we were just young. Whenever we call for program, they will say, God has something to say. God, God has, has something, something to say. To say. Yeah. Listen, listen. Pay good attention. Oh, God, God has something to say. The Bible says the steps of a good man. Steps of a good man are ordered by God and he delights. So you can't listen. If you don't listen, you will, you will get the right step, but not get the left step. You will, you will trip and fall. Learn to listen. About an issue you are dealing with, go to God. Stop looking at the notebooks of other people. They are not dealing with the same persons. And how do you do it in your church? I don't know. Go and get your blueprint. The self system that your major introduces us to needs adaptation by every church. You need to adapt it. Because if you don't adapt it, you want to put it like that. The way they do it in Korea, it won't work. We sent five people from our ministry. So he has to go three people to Korea. They came back, they taught us everything, it did not work. <laughs> because we wanted to implement it just like that, it didn't work. It did not fix him. But we have our own adaptation now that is working. We took the theory, adapted it to our environment, added some things of our own. The African way. <laughs> and it's supposed to be result. There's no mega church you hear about in Nigeria who does not have a cell system. But they are not the same. You cannot duplicate what someone is doing where you are. It won't work. I was looking at some of you protocol guys and the security who here in this country. If we are in this church in Nigeria, they will have kidnapped your pastor. <laughs> The security man who is on his phone. <laughs> you are on the phone and your pastor. <laughs> <laughs> but spend time to listen. You see, when you wake up in the morning, every time you got to talk, say, God, you have something to say. What can I do with Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Johnson that they say she's no longer leading the women's friends? What can I do? Psalm 144, verse 1, blessed be God. Who take my hands to war and my fingers to fight? You need wisdom. Some Proverbs 4 5, get wisdom, get understanding, forget not that the declare from the words of his mouth. Proverbs 4 8, wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom. We told you, get it. Get I remember one woman like that in our fellowship, that church, came to me and said, I will resign, I will resign. And drop dead out. In the morning I woke up, two, three days later, I said, what should I be saying here? He will continue. I said, you like what I said? No, 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 no. I will deal with that. I said, you want him? I said, sir, you want me to come for a fellowship uh, next Sunday? <laughs> I thought you resigned. He said, no, sir, how can I resign from God's work? <laughs> And you know, I would have messed up. I would have gotten someone else to take over from her. Well, actually, God knows what to do. It is His work. Remain fresh by listening. At times, one of the things we do in our work is not necessary. Mm -hmm. Psalm 18, verse 34. Blessed be He who came and wants to watch that a bow of steel is broken by my hands. Listen to God. That's number five. Your money has expired. <laughs> number six. Don't try to do it all. Don't try to do it all. 
We are created in the image and likeness of God. We are not intended to go through life alone. Psalm 68 and 6, God said to the solitary families, there are so many people God has sent to you to help you if you will allow them. Jethro was there when Moses was doing everything. But God said Jethro, Jethro said, hey, young man, you want to live now? You don't want to expire? You want to be on the cutting edge? This is what you do. He gave me a formula. The man introduced the formula and it worked. Wisdom is not confirmed. The wisdom of God is not something you monopolize. If any man lacks wisdom, then the master of God has given it to the liberal. They are not. Don't try to do it all alone. We ought to be relational as God is in Trinity. God says, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. Let us, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, we need other men in our lives. Let me see this too. One of the things I find I share with pastors is that after they connect my grow to preach, to begin to sing, and they destroy the atmosphere that the choir already created. <laughs> They're not called to sing. That's why God gave you a choir. That's why God gave you good people with good voices. Which one is your own again? Is it? Shall we see my song? Ah, I just want to breathe. <laughs> you messed up the whole thing. <laughs> you are not structured to sing. That's why God gave you the best voices. Don't not do other people have talents and gifts and graces for which they will give an account. And they are right all around us. It's only pride and insecurity that makes us not to be ready to share the body of leading God's people. There's one of my sons. He doesn't preach four Sundays or four Wednesdays every month. You know why? He said to me, say he doesn't have the capacity. He said to generate new verses for eight, verses, for eight services. He can't. I said, so what would you do? He said, take two Sundays and two Wednesdays. First Sunday, Last Sunday, second Wednesday, third Wednesday. So we organized some of the leaders who are also upcoming. You know, the only one who has the trumpet. There are other people too who's got trumpet. So we gave one of them upcoming things and said, You preach. Second Sunday, he will prepare that he's going to die. <laughs> you preach. Third Sunday, prepare. The attendance of the church, literally, this was the United States, increased by 250 people in four months. I'm talking about people, not figures. They are almost doing multiple services now. This was something that happened when the Division of Labor came in. Don't try to do it all. Let other people help you. That's why God has sent them into your life. Now let me give you, I said I'll give you one more here. Stay in school. Stay in school. Training is from graduate to grade. Keep training. Keep updating yourself. Attend conferences. Read books, manuals. Come to seminars of this nature. Stay in school. Ever learning, increase learning. Teach a wise man and increase in learning. Proverbs 1 4, 5. A man of understanding will attend to wise counsel. Increase learning. Keep learning, you don't know it all. Be open to what other people have to share with you. I still have three conferences I do every year, I just speak there. Nobody knows me. Now when people say Baba, welcome, Baba, 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 you know when they call you Baba, you too. <laughs> I don't wear t-shirts. This is South California. One is South California, one is in Florida. I don't wear t-shirts, dressed in jeans. 
when they are singing and they are jumping like tubes, I also join them. <laughs> and I sit down there and I soak, soak, soak. I have materials. I was telling someone, I said, I have at the last count over 500,000 ebooks that I downloaded from various people. I dream from the fountain of other people. Because you don't know it all. When Paul was writing some years ago, I saw it. He said that somebody should bring some books. And the man said, you know what? Who wrote the book that Paul was reading? Was reading? I don't know. Books. And you know what? I don't read popular authors. I read authors that help me understand the Bible. You know what I'm saying? If you do this, uh, uh, you know, popular one that will stimulate you. Stimulation is different from impartation. A woman does not get pregnant by stimulation. It's by impartation. <laughs> if you are going to grow in ministry, expose yourself to impactful sources of information. In form. Forming. I say it like this. God formed us. Sin deformed us. School informed us. Jesus reformed us. The Holy Spirit transformed us. Look at the say stay in school. Yes. school. Let the ushers expose themselves to training. Protocol expose themselves to training. Media expose themselves to training. Whatever you are serving. Whatever you are serving, even some ministers don't know how to hold my profile. This is how to hold. And so the people in the church now would be raising it until they say, oh, He doesn't know that it's just how to hold it to your mouth. You need training for many things. The word training means to shape her, to sharpen, to make sound. We didn't sound men's fellowship president. We didn't sound leaders in the youth ministry. Sound people. People who are well taught. Let him that is taught in the world communicate to him that teaches. Let me give you bonus points. My time is exceeded by three minutes. Number eight. Three things I'm going to say here. Relax. Learn how to relax. Learn how to recreate. And learn how to recharge. Relax. Recreate. And recharge. People don't know that your fresh look, your fresh man is the product of this number eight point. Relax. At times when I sleep, I sleep for 12 hours. People say, where do you get it from? He give it his beloved sleep. <laughs> <laughs> I got my pills from the world. Some three past five, some four past eight. Pills. I swallow those pills. Psalm 127 verse 2, you made it better than I relax properly. Usually because I speak or have programs Thursday to Sunday, Monday to Wednesday is total relaxation. I sleep, eat, sleep, eat, sleep, sleep, eat, sleep. <laughs> One day my wife came into the room here. I've been sleeping since yesterday, it was 5 o'clock in here. He said, what problem is wrong? I said, okay, it's wrong. He said, what are you doing? He said, relaxing. <laughs> Not only relax, but create. Look for something that will take your mind off work. At times I go on YouTube and I just laugh. I have so many of these comedy things that there. I laugh. It's called that jogging. You need to learn how to laugh. Some pastors are not laughing at anybody. <laughs> they don't enjoy a good, you know, you, 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 
thank the Lord. And sometimes I sent one or so videos to some people, and they said, ah! <laughs> so why are you sending me these uh, adjusting things? Oh, sorry. <laughs> May I, I recreate, recreate, recreate. Relax. Recreate. Take your mind off ministry at times. Why are you at home? Don't be a member of the body at home. <laughs> when I get home, I'm not a pastor. I sit down, eat, smile, everybody sees me. They say, I want that. Talk about food. Good food. <laughs> and then recharge. But you kill Jesus. No matter what little thing we, we do, Psalm 27 as 1, say, the Lord is the strength of my life. So the strength of God is still here. So that's why the scripture says in Ecclesiastes 9, 8, let your garment be always white. Let not your head. Yesterday night when I got home to the house here, I felt very tired from inside. I felt that virtual. I've been preaching since April the 1st. Right up to now. And Pastor what is expecting me to preach again tomorrow. Powerfully. You know what? You want to go for the bring and say, don't worry, just come, sir. Just money, just come. <laughs> so I lay on the bed for about 15 minutes, exhausted. And then I started saying, Holy Spirit, I started singing the Holy Spirit songs. Move me now, make my life whole again. The only time some people who serve sing that song is in the church. I do it at home. I need to recharge my battery. At times, your battery is low. When it comes to prayer, you see your battery is low. When it comes to dealing with issues, your battery is low. So remember to combine the three. Relax. Recreate. There is a park near my house there. At times, I just go to one of the stores, 7 to 11, and I buy a box of, or a big jug of juice with some crackers and so on, and I sit there in the park. What are you doing? Recreating. <laughs> that is what I can never do in Nigeria. <laughs> Even with the policemen around about the cars. <laughs> <laughs> At times yesterday, or yesterday or two days ago, I took a walk. I just walked. Just walked. And then what was I doing? I was walking to see like everybody. What are you doing? She's like, I'm not doing treadmill. <laughs> you know that treadmill that is moving on the same spot, I find it not. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is an important condition to remain fresh for the long haul. God bless you. <laughs> God bless you. Thank you very much. We celebrate God one more time and celebrate our Father and Savior and great God.